I know you're gonna dig this. This is Stan the Man Brooks, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles, recorded live here at DATV Studios in Dayton, Ohio. And now, in my studio guest, my goodness, the original member of Slave, drummer, Mr. Tim Dozier. Tim, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Oh, Thank man, you. When, once we say Slave, we have to talk about the funk. We, 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 we thank you so much for taking a little time out and, and uh, Tim, just, just, let's just get going with this, man. I, I, I'm so excited to have you here, man. The music that uh, your group um, uh, made, man, we still playing it today. So we, we're just so happy that you had a little time to talk to us. So let's just get right with it. Tell us a little bit about how Tim Dozier got started in the music field. Well, let's see, it goes back, um Oh, wow. So I was, I was about 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, I was always a creative person, even through high school. Um, although it wasn't music being creative, I was in the fine arts. And I um, kind of focused on that for a while um, to make that, kind of make a career out of that, you know, kind of slowly. And um, things kind of developed real slowly with that. But I was, I was kind of... That was the direction I was wanted to go in. Mm -hmm. I didn't pick up the music part in until um, I had I had a couple friends that had relatives that played music. Okay. And this one particular friend of mine who passed now, um, he had a snare drum in his living room, and we used to hang out all the time over there. And I used to look at the snare drum, and, say, you know, and I kind of fiddled with it. I had natural rhythm anyhow, so I just kind of fiddled with it, you know, I always wanted to do that. So I kind of fiddled with that. To make a long story short, I kind of liked it and I got, you know, I said, well, maybe I'll play drums a little bit. Well, and I kept pestering my parents for a drum kit, you know, and all that stuff. And you know, the, during those times, money wasn't falling out the sky, oh, so it was hard to get instruments to do anything. So I kind of, in high school, I made my own drumsticks on the wood, you know, on the mm -hmm. lathe in the wood shop, made me a pair of drumsticks. and. Um, use those to work out my rhythms, and I I kind of play on boxes and well, I tell drive, you, it, drive my parents crazy, you know. Yeah, yeah, because I'm a drummer myself, so yeah. I know, I know what you mean by that. It 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 will uh, uh, drive parents absolutely crazy, you know. That's one instrument that they never push you practicing at home. Right. <laughs> you know right. what I'm saying. That was before electronics <laughs> came right. in the picture, you know. Well, oh, man, but uh, now. As you uh, progressed in learning your instrument, how, how, how did you get noticed and, and how did the, the, the slave group? Uh, well, uh, okay, at that time, <clears throat> as the years progressed, you know, like during the 60s and 70s, you either played music or you played sports. Mm -hmm. And everyone was either in a band or on some kind of sports team. And all the high schools would have talent shows. And if, Roosevelt would have a talent show, oh, Rolf yeah. would have talent shows. So the idea was in the summer, instead of playing sports, let's get a group together so we can do a talent show. That was the main focus. That was it. That, that was, was it. it. And, and, you know, that's how groups, you know, people just went all over Dayton, you know, do jamming you, do, here and jamming there. Do you remember Montgomery County used to have this, this uh, uh, truck? And it had music like, truck. had a music little truck and you open it up mm -hmm. and they call it the show wag. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you ever play on that? I don't remember I did. Uh -huh. I remember looking at it uh -huh. because that's what kind of inspired us or myself mm -hmm. to play music. Because I said, man, you know, and, I, and I'd be practicing at home. I said, well, I'm probably good as those drummers up there, you know. 
And I said, well, shoot, maybe I'll join a group and see if I could play, you know. Because I, di I didn't really get any family support because, uh -huh. you know, at the time they didn't want you to do anything but work in a factory. And I didn't really think that was a good idea for, for me, uh -huh. maybe for somebody else. But anyhow, like I, those were the inspiration, watching, going to these parks, watching these other groups on these show wagons and um, just getting in a band. I even started a few myself that didn't really go nowhere. It was just, just to hone my skills. Mm -hmm and learn from other musicians. And there was a jam house that we had on Salem Avenue that a lot of groups, a lot of groups, musicians went through just to hone their skills. Yeah. And we'd go to this house. It was on, I forgot who it was owned by, but he just let us come in there and we'd play all day long. Jam sessions. Jam, just jam. That's right. Different musicians honing yeah. our skills, you know. And a lot, of, a lot of musicians, lakeside musicians, would come through there, the Beavers Brothers, um, and that's how everyone honed their skills for the talent shows. And then the rumors would go out, if someone was looking for a group, oh, I know this person, or I know this person, right. or I jam with this person. And then you just go to that place and you'd audition. And that's how a lot of musicians got into groups. So how, how, how that's did, how I got into groups. I was gonna say, how, how, how did Slave come about? It was, well, it, was, it, it, it came about, um, it was really ironic. Was that your original name? You know, that's yes, one question. Yeah, that's I, the first I, name. That, yeah, that's You know, it. that, that, that was, was no one question I, I, I couldn't answer when someone asked me that. Well, I think I they had time. some, they threw up another name when we was trying to get names together. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, I can't even remember it. It was such an uh, abstract name. Yeah. That's why I can't remember it. And then we said, no, we're going to use that. That's too, no. And then Slave is the one that we settled on. It was the second one that came out. And we said, yeah, we'll do that. But that came about because after we had got together at rehearsal, Floyd, Miller, one mm -hmm. of the horn players, he came to rehearsal with a shirt on and it had master on the front and slave on the back. And as soon as we saw that shirt, we said, yeah, okay, that's, that's going to be our name. And then, you know, we eventually uh, reworked the, you know, we had to get a meaning behind it because, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of a negative word in history, you know, and we didn't want to be known, you know, with that negative connotation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we said, well, basically, everybody's a slave to their environment and the world. And that was the more, you know, it was more um, feasible to use it that way than the negative connotation. Well, I tell you what, tell us a little bit about this. Tell us a little bit about this, man. When, how, how did all this come about as far as uh, working in the studio, what studios uh, did y'all uh, record this, uh, this big hit album that you had here? With your, uh, would you say Slide was the biggest hit? Uh, uh, I think so. You know, I think it was. Yes. And uh, because I tell you, man, this this thing right here just it, it, it it's still selling. It's well, still see, selling. We um, when I when I got with Slave, when they got me into the group, mm -hmm. I was 24 years old, mm -hmm. and all the rest of them were still in high school. Oh. Yeah. See, I I'd been playing with the young mods. And I'd been going in and out, of, you know, come home, come home, do my little. I had a part-time job at Elder Bearman, and I, we'd go on the weekends down in Louisville, Kentucky, and we'd do our show and come back. And that's and I did that for a while until I left them and joined Slate. So, me being older, I had a little taste of the road mm -hmm. and gigging. And they hadn't, so they were just ready to get away from Dayton. <laughs> you know, they were just eager to just get away from Dayton. So, and um, I didn't know that Steve Washington went to the same high school. I had already graduated from the high school that he was going to because he was living with his nephew. Okay. I mean, his uncle, Pee Wee, Pee Wee from the Ohio Players at the time, same time. So that's how he hooked up with Mark Adams. And like I said, the rumors of people needing musicians. There weren't too many drummers that were, you know, ready to go out on the road. I'd already been on the road. So it was, it was kind of a plus for me when they brought me in that way. And um, we used my van to run up and down the highway recording the tracks. For now, that, where, for where, that where were you recording that? Our first uh, demo we did at the House of Wax in Orange, New Jersey. Wow. Okay. And it was the demo, that, that demo tape, we made that demo tape to present 
And Steve Washington took that tape and presented it to Jeff Dixon, who was a radio programmer up in New Jersey. And he presented it to a friend of his, who was the president of Cotillion Records. So that was the chain of how the tape got from House of Wax okay. All right. to Cotillion Records, which is a subsidiary of Atlantic Records, to Henry Allen, through Jeff Dixon. Those were the major steps, anyhow. All right, so now, you, you record your album. Um, who was kind of, was, was the record label a little more in charge on what was, was going to be released? Uh, Pretty much, yes. Okay. Because the fact that they were so young, and we really hadn't, we didn't have too much say so on how things progressed once we signed the contract. Mm -hmm. And um, Jeff Dixon was made the manager. So we were kind of just uh, playing the music. And we didn't really bother with the details, but he was supposed to look out for all that. Okay. Well, how did it feel when you, when you first <clears throat> heard your song on radio? I mean, tell well, me, tell me, tell me. Tell what's me ironic about it, see, I was, like I said, I was working part-time jobs. Mm -hmm. And the album had been released. It was in the racks in a store that I was working, okay? Because we hadn't left to go on the road yet. You know, it was released and everything, and we were trying to get together to get our tour together and whatever. And I was still working at the time at Elder Beerman, so I brought my supervisor over to one of the records bins, and a slave was sitting in a record bin right there, and I pulled it out and turned it over and showed it to him. <laughs> said, well, I won't be working here too much longer. <laughs> that's, and that's exactly what I told him, you know. He said, and he was surprised, you know. He said, well, I didn't know you did that. And he wished me good luck and everything. So, you know, after the album hit the, hit the they, they started playing the album before it was actually released. And there was a big surge on the radio about where's the, where's the album, where's the album? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it hadn't been released yet. So that kind of helped us when it was actually released to, you know, get out and start rocket it, rocket it up the charts right. because people were in demand for it. I don't know if that was a publicity thing on on part of the record company or what, you know. Well, sometimes it is. But it worked. Yeah. You know, it worked. You know. Sometimes it is. The thing is, is that once you once you get a hit record now, everybody now wants to see who, who this band is. Right. So now, mm -hmm. uh, did you do any television appearances? Did y'all? That was one of the things I was really disappointed about. We had, when I, I before never, I left. A I big did, hit like this, I No did, Soul Train. I did three albums with them. Uh -huh. And we weren't on TV one time. Out of all that, it was about a year and a half after the first album came out. And it was just amazing to me that I said, well, why aren't we doing any TV? But, and unfortunately, our manager didn't have enough confidence in us mm -hmm. to say we were ready for TV. Yet your, yet your, your, your song is selling like, mm -hmm. selling like hot cake. Yeah. Wow, man. See, that's, th this is why I love this show. That, you know, we, we were able to get in, 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 in depth on, on some things with you musicians that uh, a lot of people would have. Because I just assumed, you know, especially with this, as right. big as the song was, mm -hmm. that you were at least able to do uh, a Soul Train or something like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, well, I tell you what. It still was uh, was still one of the biggest R and B songs of that era, and 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 especially you play it today, bam, and and, and people are still on that dance floor and, and and doing what they need to do, man. We just enjoy it, and uh, we 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 appreciate uh, all your uh, what we would say. Um, I when we when you take local musicians like we do here and put them on on wax. And, and, it's every, and it's able to take the test of time. Yeah. And this is definitely what, what the slave group has done. Now, when you said you did two or three albums, name, name a few of those other cuts that, that were pretty big for y'all. Um, uh, let's see. Well, the one I'm, like I said, the one I'm most familiar with is Slide. Mm -hmm. And because at the time, um, I'm not sure if that was the only hit off that album. It might have been another one, but I know the hardness of the world. There was a few hits off that. Okay. Um, that I can't even remember because. Um, 
during the after we recorded the third album, which was the concept, mm -hmm. and I left the group. I just kind of dissociated myself with the whole business for about five, six years. I didn't follow them anymore because um, it was it was um, unfortunately it was it was bad feelings, uh -huh. you know. And um, well, I tell you, man, uh, the thing is, is that we're here today. To make sure that uh, uh, our 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 audience get a chance to 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 get to know uh, Tim Dozier as far as a, as a musician back in the day, to let them know that this was one of your biggest highlights of, 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 of your career. Yes, and, it was. And that uh, you know we we. I mean, I'm not blaming anybody or nothing. It's just oh no, no, no I, just, and, I, and, and I appreciate that. It's just uh, we were a victim of the youth. Uh -huh. And the naive, naive, being naive. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I was naive, even though I was 24. I was a little bit naive because I hadn't been at that level either. The, but the, I, th the thing is, is you know, and 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 I've interviewed uh, uh, many groups who, when we talk show business, mm -hmm. love the show and didn't take care of the business part of it. Yeah. And and and. Uh, did that happen to, to y'all? And what, what I'm saying by that is like, did 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 the album sell or the song sold? But for some reason, studio and, and producers and people like that got more than the artists, and and it ended well, up being a financial burden in, instead of a, a profit. Well, there's no way that we could have um, we could tell uh -huh. who was getting what because. Uh -huh. Um, the fact that we were so young and we put all our trust in our managers mm -hmm. and his assistants, the people working for him, um, we really couldn't, I guess, hold them mm -hmm. to give us the accurate figures. Because mm -hmm. when we had business meetings at our manager's office, he would actually just sit, us, sit up there and say, you know, I don't have the accurate figures every time. Wow. And he said the record company has 60 days to give us the accurate figures. And that's all we heard every time we sat down. So we never knew if we were getting what we were supposed to get or how much we were supposed to get. And foremost, you know, all we really want to do was play music that's and it. perform. That, that's usually what it, you know, and, says. and we felt it shouldn't have been on us mm -hmm. to do that. It should have been on them to make sure we had the right numbers, which added to the, you know, down the road, a lot of confusion you know, frustration right. and tension because, you know, we, we can't bicker with him, so we end up bickering between ourselves, which is which messed up our creative, you know, our flow of cre being creative right. and stuff like that. But it's just growing pains, I guess you would call them. All right, so you saying that after after you left the group, you then went ahead and just said, hey, I'm just cool it for a while. Did you ever get back on your set at all? Uh, yeah, I did. I did. Okay. I came back home uh, kind of in shock. Uh -huh. Because after, like I said, we there was a lot of people working with us that had never worked with us before or mm -hmm. did any national um, managing. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I appreciate all the help we had and mm -hmm. the people that helped us, but they they were limited on the experience on what you know to work with a national recording act, and we suffered from it. So we, you know, like I said, when we came home, there was no more living expense money. And our manager sent us home. That's essentially what he told us. Well, I tell broke. you, broke. So when I came back home, mm -hmm. I was kind of in shock and a little bit. You know, I said, "Wow, it just the bottom just fell out of everything." And I started working with local groups, and uh, I still have my contacts in New York, and I put a few groups together, hoping to save them some of the pitfalls we went through, and they let me down. Mm -hmm. And um, so then I just started playing in local bands, but I kept playing. You know, I'm still playing today. Are you? Yeah. Oh. I'm 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 playing um, timbales actually with a Santana Latin music group. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, one of the guys that I had put played with when I left Slave, mm -hmm. we'd formed a group uh, called Electronic Countermeasures, and what we did we played jazz fusion, and we did recordings and we played a few bar band a few bar mm -hmm. shows, and we weren't really trying to make it big. We just wanted to hone our skills and that kind of fizzled down the road but the guitar player in that was Terry Harris and he now has a Santana tribute band 
where we just play Santana's music. Oh, that's great. And that's I'm great. playing timbales for him on, in that group, which kind of helps my skills since he already had a drummer. So, but uh, I'm having a good time. Well, we're glad to hear that, man. Time. You know, because I, I hate to see your talent not being out there, so 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 other people can enjoy it. Uh, now, Tim, you know we're here also today because uh, uh, David Webb and his organization is is uh, is definitely involved in the. Uh, getting this funk museum off the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me a little bit about, what do you think about that? And, and, and what, I really what could Tim Dozier could, 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 could give, just give us some of your uh, ideals and things that you, we might take? Hmm. I really, well, first of all, I appreciate what he's doing. I'm mm -hmm. glad he's doing it. You know, this, like I said, Dayton is a music town. It's always been a music town. and. A lot of people all over the world know about Dayton being a music town and a mm -hmm. funk town. It's good that he's doing this, and you know I just um, hope that people contribute, continue to contribute to that, so he can get it off the ground and, and make a lasting legacy for the Dayton area, for the musicians here, mm -hmm. because um, the musicians I don't think they have you know there's nothing here now, you know that's going to. Uh, inspire the young musicians coming up. Well, if he gets, if he, you know, like I yeah, said, when that's uh -huh. when that's here, then they can go in there and they can see what it takes and what they can achieve through dedication. You know. Well, and 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 we're going to also have uh, uh, music classes in the museum. We're going to get some of our uh, music teachers and 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 musicians who have retired now to, to come back and, and help the, the young uh, uh, get off the ground and and I'm thinking about yeah. you man you know just that'd be say, fine you that'd know be what fine. I'm saying yeah to I just, mean I'd be good I mean I'm not doing <laughs> it'd be great just to teach some young young uh, musicians the, yeah. the roots but, around funk right because you when know. you're sitting up there and you said you made your first drumsticks and stuff I go well you know I, I like that man that's just something that people just don't understand I I when I when I started playing drums, I kept my I was only like 12 years old, and I was playing professionally at 12 and 13 years old, and I kept my first pair of sticks for one year. I meant and gave them back to my mother. They were tore up, mm -hmm. chipped up, but they were still together. Yeah. And you know she put those sticks up for me, man. 20, 30 years later, and, and I just look at them uh, off and on now because it's just something, man. That's just, amazing. You can it, still it is, and yeah. and. Uh, I mean, oh. I still got an old drum bag. <laughs> Do you my, really? My first, my first original drum bag I used when I played. Hey, hey. and well, I still have it. We 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 want some things put in that museum, and you'd be mm -hmm. surprised. Hey, slave original drummer, boom! Here's a drum bag. You'd be surprised how many people go. Can I? Can I? I want to just look at it. You know, it, it. Those kind of things, man. You'd be surprised what when you go into a museum, the things that be there. So make sure you and Dave get together on. Uh, on some of that, if you have anything that uh, okay. you, you might Yeah, because he mentioned that to me, and I said, well, it's hard for me to, there's a lot of stuff I lost when I lost my house, because yeah. I had a lot of stuff in my house, mm -hmm. and I went through a thing there where I, you know, that housing crisis everybody went through, I, had, oh, yeah. I, was, I got caught up in that and lost my house, but I had a lot of stuff in that, um, old briefcase I used when we was traveling on the road, with all the slave liquor stickers on it. You, stuff what, like that. What, you what, know? Oh man, that 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 would be great. Yeah. Uh, those kind of things, man, is something that uh, I hope you and Dave get to talk about, so that you you can uh, see see what you can contribute. We sure appreciate sure. that. No you know. problem. So no problem. Uh, that's the thing about the Funk Museum, man. It's trying to keep uh, uh, the legacy alive, uh, especially you know, because it's not just for our date musicians. This is, this is going to be. Uh, a nationally known museum, and we we definitely want uh, Slave and you and the rest of uh, 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 the group to get involved with it in any way possible. If sure, you can, no man. problem. I'd be know. glad to do it. Well, well I'd be good. Glad to do it. Well, I, I I I appreciate everything, man. If it's anything that you you want your fans to know about uh, 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 Tim Dozier right now, this is a good chance to to let them know. You know, hey, we. Where are you going to be, or anything like that? Or? Well, I'm not. Well, the group that we're at now, we're still piecing piece, you know, uh -huh. uh, pieces together, because they said when you do a tribute band, um, <clears throat> there's not much room for. Well, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, 
it's not like a regular band. You no, know, like no. a regular band, you can just bring anybody in. Right, right. But when you're doing a tribute band, you have to have certain people that have the skills to play exactly. And to make it sound. To make it sound, because that's like what the original. audience wants right. to hear. They right. don't want to hear you. They want to hear Carlos Santana. Right. And you have to be able to represent that. So it's kind of a, you know, process of getting weeding out musicians that, that just want to do that. And a lot of times, they don't just want to do that. Mm -hmm. They want to do other things. So, like I said, it's it's a learning learning thing. Well, but I, it's I, fun. I it's appreciate fun. you. Appreciate you giving us our time. You know. Appreciate you having me here. Tim Doja, you know. original member of Slave, percussionist. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks a lot. Thanks Alrighty. for having me. This is Stan the Man Brooks, host of Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles. Until next time, keep it funky. Thank you.